Welcome, and just so you, you must realize by now, if you've been here for more than a couple minutes, that you are on the campus of Portsmouth Abbey School. Um, we are a co-educational, boarding day, college preparatory, secondary school run under the auspices of the Order of St. Benedict, Portsmouth, Rhode Island. <clears throat> and we have a campus culture that is strongly informed by our Catholic tradition and also by our Benedictine tradition and the presence of our Benedictine community. And what that means to us here, well, first of all, it means a lot, but there are certain qualities of, of, of a Benedictine institution, which I always mention when I have an opportunity like this, and these are qualities that really inform the kind of school and campus that we are. Qualities of prayer, obedience, stability, discipline, stewardship. If you go to go see the wind turbine, you will see an example of that stewardship. Humility, community, hospitality, love, and justice. All qualities of any good Benedictine monastery and qualities which inform our, our school community. Um, Important to the school culture here um, is the fact that families who send their kids to, to this school are attracted to the school because of its mission. And that's really important because as kids come here, families are confident that the messages that they're receiving at home and the messages that they're receiving at the school are the right ones. And I know they're the right ones that they're getting here, for sure. And uh, in many, many cases, the, the same from, from both, uh, both home and school. Now, Ms. Gallagher will be speaking this morning on the topic of William F. Buckley and the family, and we at Portsmouth are very proud to have actually had the William F. Buckley Jr. family as one of our own back from 1966 to 1970 when uh, son Christopher Buckley was a student here. So, um, now it's time to introduce Maggie. Maggie Gallagher is a writer and commentator who has written a syndicated column for a Universal Press Syndicate since 1995. She serves as president of the Institute for Marriage and Public Policy, a conservative think tank, think tank whose purpose is strengthening marriage for a new generation. Her most recent book is The Case for Marriage, Why Married People Are Happier, Healthier, and Better Off Financially, which she co-authored co -authored with Linda Waite. Ms. Gallagher is from Lake Oswego, Oregon, and a graduate of Yale University with a BA in Religious Studies. Maggie, welcome to Portsmouth Abbey School, and I'm pleased to introduce you. I just want to add thank you, by the way. It's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, uh, less than two years ago, I also founded an activist organization, the National Organization for Marriage, which we do have a chapter here in Rhode Island that's fighting to protect marriage as the union of one man and one woman. Um, again, thank you for being here. It's just a pleasure. Um, what I do now mostly, it's very odd. I know I'm a writer and I work with serious scholars and uh, I give speeches and what I've done mostly the last couple of years is become the girl who goes around the country talking about gay marriage. It's a very odd career description. I certainly never expected it. So it's a pleasure to take a break from that in a way um, and uh, to reflect on uh, a man whom we all admire, who most of our, oh, certainly almost everyone who knew him personally um, with the possible exception of Gore, we all admired. And, um, and uh, I would like to say I did know Bill. Uh, I, I didn't really know him well, and I want to I, I want to say that as a caveat, but also maybe as a tribute, because the way that I know Bill and the way that he helped me, I it, it, it it's nothing special. There were really probably literally hundreds, if not thousands, of people whose uh, careers uh, Bill helped launch, that nobody ever knows about it, and uh, he did it without thinking about it very much with the kind of consistent generosity of character uh, that he had. When I, my first job at, after college was as a, an editorial assistant at National Review. Um, I worked there for several years and eventually rose to become article editor, which is the was then the big middle chunk of the, of the magazine. At that time, Bill was still the active editor, so every two weeks he was there. Um, w once in a while, I was lucky enough to be treated to the famous lunches at Peonies with Bill, which was an experience. 
Uh, and I became a Cinda after I moved on and I uh, helped found the City Journal and I started writing a column for New York Newsday, which was a Manhattan paper that no longer exists. And uh, people came up to me and they said, well, you know, we really like your column. Have you considered being a syndicated columnist? And after about the third person, I started thinking about that. And I did the only thing I know. If, if this hadn't worked, I would have, you know, gone on to some other idea. I, 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 I wrote a note to Bill and I said, people seem to like my column. You have any advice for me on how to become a syndicated columnist? And he wrote back, well, the only, only person I know is the guy who's the editorial director of my syndicate, Lee Salem, and I'll introduce you to him. And uh, they looked at my columns for about a year and later gave me a syndicated column. Um, I wrote a little bit about that. I didn't write a column when Bill died because I had written a column. I felt, I felt good about this. Uh, when he retired, about two years before he died. And it also is very characteristic. I was in my, um, we're actually moving to Washington, D.C., so I was just going through papers and I came across this as my last little, uh, um, well, no, this is my second to the last little note from Bill. Because it just says, that, Dear Maggie, a fine essay in the Weekly Standard. My congratulations. We miss you in this part of the world. Love, Bill. And, you know, Bill was a very famous man, and I'm really not. I, I, it's just, the, the number of people that he wrote encouraging <laughs> notes like that to is really extraordinary. Um, and it's rare to find someone who uh, was such a great man and also such a good man. I think he represents the very, a very important figure in American culture, and in particularly in the conservative movement. Uh, because he was the first conservative who, when he achieved notoriety, refused to grow. Now, I don't know how many of you remember how persistently it seemed as if, as soon as people rose to a certain level and were inducted into the glamorous world of Manhattan, suddenly their political convictions started to shift steadily to the left. And Bill instead went out and created a world, a glamorous world around him, and pulled many of us into the outer orbit and some people into the inner orbit and uh, made America a, a different place with his gifts, his, 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 his gifts as a thinker and as a writer, uh, but even more, his, the gift of his character. Um, when I agreed to do a presentation called William F. Buckley and the Family, I didn't know that both his son and his literary son would have written books about him in the, in the scant time, but written and published them. Um, I haven't read Chris Buckley's book, uh, but I did read the excerpt in the New York Times where I gather they took everything that was critical or negative and stuck it in one piece for everyone to enjoy in Manhattan. Um, I, I will make a little pitch for his, his uh, uh, I think Rick, who is a friend of mine from Yale, uh, refers to himself as the, as the adopted or the literary son of, of William F. Buckley. It's called Right Time, Right Place, Coming of Age with William F. Buckley Jr. and the Conservative Movement. And I, I actually did read this, although I also, of course, went to the index, and yeah, you know, you can, there's a couple of couple sentences about me in there and my time, because he was, uh, Rick was the editor while I was there. But, you know, and I have very mixed feelings about Chris, uh, I'm sure anyone who read it, who loved Bill, had mixed feelings. Bill loved Chris very much, obviously, and would not be interested in all of us getting upset because his son wrote a book. Uh, but uh, there was something about it that maybe it's just very characteristic of our age. You, have, you, read, you read this and you have this strong sense that, that there is no way Chris would have written a book like this while his father was alive and that he needed to do it as soon as Bill was dead. Um, but I saw him at the 92nd Street Y talking about it, and it was interesting to me. He said, someone brought up how, what a, what a, what a difficult father Bill was. And uh, Chris kind of leaned back in a very characteristic and familiar gesture and said, yes, I'm the Park Avenue Frank McCourt. And, um, and then he went on to say, kind of summing up, he said, you know, they were very loving parents. But he was the star of his own movie, and she was the co-star of his movie, and you know, sometimes it was a little much, which seems to me to be a pretty fair thing to say. It can be very difficult to be the son of a celebrity successful father. I think on, on, on uh, uh, when, you, when you take the warts and all bill as he's been revealed after his death, 
he's still an extremely impressive man. Um, and um, what I was going to talk to you about a little bit is the, 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 the development of the family as an issue during the lifetime of William F. Buckley and in the movement that he helped found. Um, the, Bill, Bill was a very uh, deep, as you know, he had a very deep Catholic faith. He was a very strong believer in marriage and the family. Um, my first two books you've probably never heard of, uh, the first is called Enemies of Eros and it's a critique of the sexual revolution. And the second was called The Abolition of Marriage, How We Destroy Lasting Love. And he gave me rather over the top uh, blurbs for each of those books, probably better than they deserved, uh, which I think was a mark of uh, you know, uh, his, he didn't write about these things a lot, but he cared about them quite a lot. And uh, he forged a movement in which these issues had a particular kind of place. I mean, how many of you are familiar with the term fusionism as a, as a, no, <laughs> yes. Well, that, you know, National Review was founded in the, in the 50s and in the 50s and 60s. The two big wings of the conservative movement were traditionalists and libertarians. And the problem was trying to craft in some sort of overarching philosophy in which both of these wings could coexist because European traditionalism and American libertarianism really don't have very much in common. And uh, a man by the name of Frank Meyer, who worked for National Review, crafted an idea that held together these wings and allowed them to give birth to a political and cultural mo movement and it's, and it's called fusionism. And it is a way of, uh, supporting, uh, of, of, of supporting the idea of moral truth and the idea therefore of absolute moral values as regulators of behaviors and of support for the institutions that um, make these moral virtues visible and transmit them to the next generation, schools, churches, religious communities, uh, with a perhaps broader than traditional, traditional European traditionalism respect for personal freedom or liberty. So uh, I'm summing up probably inadequately, but in a nutshell, it's, it, it's the idea that God gave us freedom and that we therefore should live in a society where we are free to do, even to do things that are wrong uh, within certain limits, but that uh, culture and institutions should respect, promote, and support the idea of right and wrong, right? And it fit in very much. It kind of arose out of that time, again, if went, once you move out of the 50s into the 60s and the turbulence and the law and order message um, and uh, you still hear people talk about that as a, as a reality today, that, that that's the way these things fit together. Um, but as the conservative movement unfolded, I was thinking about this, there were some specific intellectual or ideological challenges to fusionism that were coming from the left that make it more and more um, difficult for the conservative movement to rest on the, the pillars that fusionism crafted. And uh, the first issue was abortion. Okay, so the, the Supreme Court stepped in in 1971 and began to use the law essentially as a, as, as a, um, as a spear, really, into the heart of, of traditional, uh, of respect for these traditional moral values and for Christian moral values in particular. And uh, the abortion issue remains deeply troubling because it simply doesn't fit into any of the existing paradigms very well, right? You, you can't be fusionist about the question of whether or not, you can't be, either the law respects life or it doesn't, right? Either the, Either, either every, um, every human being is entitled to respect not only culturally but the protection of the laws or they aren't. Only some people are entitled to that. And then you have, someone has to decide who counts as a person, right? So if it's not every human being by virtue of being alive has rights, we're in a totally different universe where, where 
someone, and in this case it turns out to be the Supreme Court, assuming neutrality, right? This is, the, if you go back and you look at the language of Roe, it says you're free to believe what you want, except that, of course, you're not free to act as if it really were true that every year a million human beings are, are, are being killed voluntarily uh, through no fault of their own, and that if we, what the Supreme Court really said in Roe, is that the law intervenes and attempts to protect those lives in any way, presumably, we've been fighting through that through other court cases, um, that uh, uh, it is the law which is wrong and not the taking of the human life. There's a, there's a kind of trick to this. That it, well, liberalism is very, modern sexual liberalism is very good at presenting itself not just as a matter of spin, but in its heart, it believes that it's neutral as it aggressively pushes out uh, into the rest of the society and uses the power of law to impose and reinforce and sustain its own values. And we all know that, um, so that, that became a, a point at which, and, and which by and large, I would say, the conservative movement responded in the best of the American tradition of, of, of the universality of human rights, of the universality of the Declaration of Independence, and of the necessity for standing, not only for the idea that, that abortion is unpleasant, or it would be nice if it didn't, wasn't necessary, but that there's something wrong about our failure to step in and protect every human being. It's a, it's a failure of the core promise of the equal dignity of every human being. And uh, it is also a triumph. I know that it's when I, I was 11 when Roe v. Wade was decided, and there was much dissatisfaction among people who are pro-life about what was accomplished. But from a broader perspective, looking at Europe and Canada and other developed uh, democracies, it really actually was extraordinary. It is extremely rare for a Supreme Court decision to remain controversial for 50 years and for a living uh, political, legal, and cultural movement, you know, deeply fed by the springs of, 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 of religious faith, obviously, uh, to be still standing in the face of that kind, because you know, America is a big, fat, happy country. I mean, not particularly the last six months or so, but whatever is is good is a, is the is the way American society will tend to work. It's it, it's hard to summon up resistance to the idea that something is fundamentally wrong in America um, at at this scale when the Supreme Court is telling you it's a right. So that was the first wing of of uh, what, in a sense. Made, it, made the fusionist compromise where culture and values are supported verbally, but the law is dedicated to freedom. The, the life issue just really calls in a very deep way, calls into question whether you can sustain that or whether you have to choose. And I think the other issue, which is the issue that I've spent most of, I write about many things, as some of you know, but, but, uh, but marriage and family is the thing that I've written about the most and that I know about the most and that I've dedicated most of my career to. And I, I think that in a, in a very core way, it represents a second such challenge to uh, philosophically and intellectually to holding together the two wings of the conservative movement. And, and of course, that's important only if the conservative movement is important to the common good of the United States and, and the world as well. That's what we, we, we actually care about. Political movements are means to ends. They're not ends in themselves. Um, and because marriage, and, and it's a somewhat different, one of the reasons that abortion is still a live issue is that although it challenges the idea that you can be neutral and you eat, one person can say yes it's a human being and another person can say no it's a human being and we can all act like that's a, a normal society uh, but the argument for life is deep is a deeply liberal one it's a classically liberal one right it fits very comfortably within the dominant strand of the american tradition we have a victim we have millions of victims at this point, um, whom we are failing to protect. And uh, as I've uh, uh, done the marriage debate for the last 20 years, I've thought a lot about why the marriage issue is so different and so difficult for both American conservatives and liberals to, to, 
to handle. And I should pause and say, I, 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 for the last six years, I've done mostly the gay marriage debate. But for the about 15 years before that, I was deeply involved in that other marriage debate. Uh, I don't know if some of you remember it, that, about our high rates of divorce and family fragmentation and so many children growing up fatherless. When I wrote my first book in 89, it was about the height of uh, celebration of these trends as a, by, by progressives as a sign of moral progress. Right? People were saying that this was not a decline, that the people who thought it was a decline were religious zealots who hated single mothers. And um, that uh, uh, it represented an expansion of freedom and a release from archaic moral values, right? That's, that's what people said about divorce and unmarried childbearing as, when I came of age and when I was working in National Review and I actually started, first started to write about these issues there. Um, and um, the... Uh, in the course of about 15 years, something extraordinary happened in that other debate. Um, cultural elites changed their minds. Now, they were helped by the fact that distinguished scholars began to change their minds. I, uh, this doesn't happen very often, by the way. The way scientific change usually happens is the older generation remains committed to one paradigm and they die off and the younger generation adopts the new paradigm. But what we actually saw in the 80s and the 90s is a whole generation of sociologists and psychologists and uh, uh, affiliated professions, with some exceptions, begin to take seriously the idea that family decline was not a good thing, that it would be, it would be better that, but, well, yes, maybe some marriages are not healthy and need, it's not necessarily bad that we want to keep every marriage together these elites would say, but our high rates of divorce are hurting children. And uh, we worked hard at getting the evidence before the American people, before these intellectual networks, and it didn't happen all on its own, but it, it was, you know, we, by, by the year 2000, we had reached a point where it seemed like common sense was allowed to prevail. So when I started in the marriage debate in 89, uh, if you said marriage really matters because children need a mom and a dad, you were described as a religious zealot who hated women. And by 2000, I could walk into any room and I could say, all things be equal, children do better with a mom and dad who's married, and people would nod their head and say, well, that's, that's obvious, that's common sense, right? Um, and then with the advent of the gay marriage debate, it changed again. And I, know, I, began, I began to be concerned because I noticed that we had won this intellectual debate except the only voices that were starting to be raised in protest and quoted were advocates for lesbian and gay parenting, who were willing to say that two parents are better than one, but who objected to the idea that there was anything special about the child's own mother and father. And uh, as I read, started, as I became involved in this, this debate, it became clear to me that from the standpoint of people who care about marriage, same-sex marriage is a, an, an utter transformation in the core public meaning and purpose of marriage that would make all the work I had tried to do on these practical problems of fatherlessness and family fragmentation uh, impossible to do in the future. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But what I want to say about the marriage debate that makes it kind of difficult for Americans is that, that it doesn't fit comfortably into the liberal paradigm, and by which I mean the classically liberal paradigm that both conservatives and liberals share. The, 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 the marriage is a pre-liberal institution. Okay, marriage and family are pre-liberal institutions. They are the only real pre-liberal institution standing, except for the church, which got integrated into the American paradigm through religious liberty, right? So, um, and you can see now an ongoing attempt to do the same thing with marriage and the family, but there's some stubborn facts here. You don't choose, and the distinguishing trait of family is that you don't choose who your family members are, right? The people that you really love and care about, who you're not related to uh, through family, those people are your friends, and you choose them, and they're a very important part of life. 
The family, as its kind of conceptual distinguishing characteristic, are the people that you have obligations to whether or not you like them, right? And the family, of course, generates affection and, and neuroses and, you know, tight emotional bonds, and it's very psychologically and emotionally and spiritually significant. But, and so, and, and we may not even think about obligation, we may think about love as being at the top of it, but what makes it family rather than friendship or something else is this unchosen obligation based primarily on the body, which makes it even odder for uh, Americans. You know, they're, marriage and the, now, the weak, the weak point of this system is in fact marriage, because you can't marry your sister, although the Egyptians tried apparently, but you know, incest is, <laughs> taboos against incest are one of the, marriage is a universal human institution, and taboos on incest, which get, do get defined somewhat differently in different cultures, but every culture has them. You can't marry your close kin, however that, however that is defined in that uh, society, and, um, or at least not all of your close kin, there's degrees. So, so, and in our culture, thanks to the Catholic Church, marriage has always been a choice. I mean, that was a battle that the church fought and won, you know, a thousand years ago. Um, you, ma marriage is based on the voluntary consent of the couple, and the exchange of vows of the couple is what creates the marriage. Without that, there is no marriage. So you can't marry off your daughters uh, or sons, uh, because they have to marry each other. And so that makes it also, again, it's this peculiarity, it's your closest, in, in our system, it's your, again, thanks to Christianity, your husband or your wife is your closest family member because you're supposed to leave your mother and father and two become one. That's not a human universal, by the way. There's many kin systems where there's a, the husband and wife bond is always very important, but the, the parental child bond can trump the marital bond in, in many family systems that we see around the globe. So marriage is kind of a, it's, it's a problem in a lot of ways. It's a, it is the problem in kinship because it, you're not you're, you're taking biological strangers and making them your closest family members. Um, and it's a problem conceptually for the whole system because uh, once you choose it it, 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 it either has to be persistent and enduring and have a larger life than your choice or marriage itself disappears. This is what's interesting, as I began in the 80s, to go back and read, you know, think about what we were doing with no-fault divorce and a, a culture which was encouraging, you know, choice in family life and celebrating the, 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 the high rates of divorce, therefore, as an expression of freedom. And, and um, uh, I mean, one big thing became obvious, which is that some, th this, was, this was a lie because what was really happening was that some choices were getting easier and some choices were getting really, really much harder, right? If you wanted to leave your marriage, it would be much easier. But if you wanted to make a permanent or enduring vow to another human being, it was much, much harder. If you wanted to make sure that your child had two parents, you know, raising them together, it became much, much harder. And uh, so, but there's another, another kind of conceptual level where marriage is, um, where, where this idea of the celebration of free choice is wrong. You know, if you go back to the 19th century, they understood clearly that love, which free love, free love was the opposite of marriage, okay? Free love was when two people stayed together only because they loved each other, they stayed together as long as they loved each other, and they felt any sort of ties of obligation, which is the core concept of kinship, to be an imposition or an interference with the love itself. And by the 70s, we had created a culture where people were celebrating a vision of marriage in which you couldn't tell the difference between marriage and free love, right? We celebrated marriage because it, in our concept, it represented the ideal loving relationship. And if it didn't, well, then you went on and found other partners and kept trying until you either, you either found one or you died, right? That was, so, um, that's, uh, so that's, you, you can understand that though as part of the process of trying to take this essentially pre-liberal institution of marriage and the family, which is based at, at, again, the core is obligation, not choice, and uh, relationships that are not 
created by you that you inherit and that you foster and nourish or you don't. You know, when I try to go out and explain to non-Catholics, by the way, my mother left the church in 68 when I was eight. I came back to the church in my late 20s, primarily because of the church's teachings on sex, marriage, and, and family, which is not the way you, people usually come back to the church. But when I try to, um, but you know, I, came, I actually came to see that this is what people really want. They want a love that's bigger than their choice, that, 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 that giving yourself to another human being for the rest of your life is the kind of most dramatic and morally significant and interesting thing that you do. And that the, cult, the sexual culture of free love and free choice therefore takes away, it corrodes the capacity to do one core and important and meaningful thing with your life. Um, so we, uh, the, uh, the, so the, 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 the attempt to make marriage compatible with li classical liberalism, with the basic thrust, to take this pre-liberal institution, uh, you know, it, 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 and make it fit into the paradigm where we, what we value is the right of the self-created individual to choose their identity and destiny, right? There was just this, this collision course um, which we are now living through, which my generation lives through the most intense expression of, and the children that come after may not even be aware of the conflict because a lot of them have, live in communities now in which there is no real working concept or models of, of marriage at all. Um, and uh, the result, the second thing that happens, I would say, that when you conceptualize marriage as being like free love, people stop getting married, right? Because there really isn't a lot of point to it. If in fact the point of marriage is you live with someone until you don't want to live with them anymore, why go through that divorce stuff, right? It's really, it's very painful and expensive. And so that's what, I think that's a lot of what we're seeing right now in addition to the, just the, the terribly corrosive effects of, of the sexual culture generally. I don't know how many of you know, uh, between, uh, for about 10 years, I mean, for about seven years, it looked like the out-of-wedlock birth rate was beginning to peak. And we, I thought we'd begin the exciting job of pushing to create an America where every year fewer and fewer children, however many little fewer, at least it would be less and less. And then um, around the time the same-sex marriage debate hit, you, you could never prove this, and I'm not asserting that it's cause and effect, but it is the same time frame uh, the out of wedlock birth rate started skyrocketing again. So now, when I was born in 1960, 95% of children were born to married couples, and 85% of those marriages lasted for life. So now, 40% uh, of American children are born out of wedlock. By the way, that means probably the majority of women become mothers for the first time out of wedlock. Uh, I haven't actually gone back and looked at it, but there's a relationship between the overall figure and the first entry into motherhood, which strongly suggests we're, we must be very close to that, if not already over that. Um, and um, probably right now, a little less than half of all marriages end in divorce. The good news for the people uh, in this room, the young people in this room, is that college-educated people have much lower divorce rates. That's actually dropped significantly. But for the average American, for you know, what we're seeing is this enormous accumulation of capital. The most advantaged people, the people who have the most education uh, and all of the social and human capital that, that suggests, are also the people most likely to have the powerful advantages of marriage. Um, and uh, wh what we have learned from this social experiment, I mean, in addition to learning that what happens when you try to weaken marriage to the point that it is really conceptually like free love is that you really do kill marriage, right? That's, that's one thing we've learned. We've learned that children are hurt very badly, okay? Now, we all know that, you know, children don't need mothers and fathers the way they need oxygen. There are plenty of uh, young, fine young men and women who uh, surmount the, the disadvantages and the trauma and go on to become fine human beings capable of love and work. But a certain 
percentage do not. I mean, we, we, we see long-term victims of this culture of family fragmentation and fatherlessness. And uh, almost all children uh, suffer as a result of the, fail the, the collapse of the family. And uh, human beings overcome traumas and can rise above their circumstances, but it's certainly not the job of parents or the community to give children uh, really painful handicaps that they have to overcome. It's just much, much harder for these kids through no fault of their own, through nothing that they have done. Um, the other thing we know uh, is that marriage is a generator of, of, of human and social capital for adults as well. Men and women who marry are better off in every way we know how to measure. You, you actually live longer, you're physically healthier, you, you, uh, you're emotionally happier, you're less anxiety, less depression, less hostility, you're uh, more likely, you make more money than otherwise similar singles, and uh, you even have a better sex more often, particularly over the life cycle if you're married than if you're single. Um, so we've created a culture which has celebrated a, a choice, which has made the one choice which is essential to human flourishing much, much harder. Um, I've, uh, I entered the gay marriage debate because I do think that ideas have consequences. And the frame, this is, this is why it's hard to argue because Americans don't think institutionally. We think we're self-created individuals, and then in mass, we adopt the new ideas that are being institutionally uh, pushed from the top down. It's, it's really, if you step back, I don't know what, for the younger people here in your generation, you will suddenly see become the thing that everyone must believe, but I know it'll be something. It'll be quite, quite interesting to watch as it, as it evolves. Um, marriage, here, here's why I care about it and why I think this, the gay marriage part, just briefly, is worth uh, de devoting my life to and, and worth fighting about and for. Um, the heart of the gay marriage idea, it's not, it's not what gay couples do that I'm worried about. Okay, you know, people do a lot of this, a lot of people doing things that I don't actually happen to agree with out there. That's, what happens is when the government changes the core meaning of a basic institution at law, uh, uh, and the heart of the gay marriage idea is that there is no difference between same sex and opposite sex unions. And if you see a difference, you're like a bigot who's opposed to interracial marriage, right? The marriage idea, as we've historically understood, has been exactly the opposite. I mean, it sits there in the law and the culture. It's this. And it points and it says, look, there's something special about unions of husband and wife. Because we need to bring together the two great halves of humanity, male and female, to make and raise the next generation and so that children can know and be known by and love and be loved by their own mother and father. To say that you must treat same-sex unions as, that equality requires treating same-sex unions like unions of husband and wife is to say there is nothing unique or distinctive or important about the one great difference which every, you know, marriage has been a, a way every human society tries to grapple with the fact that men and women are mostly attracted to each other. And it takes a lot of energy if you want to protect children and give them a mother and father. And it's very difficult for me to understand how we can possibly rebuild the marriage culture if our government is committed to the idea that people like me, who think children need mothers and fathers, are like bigots who oppose interracial marriage. And I will just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll close with that, except to say that we're beginning to see that unfold. I mean, we're beginning to see it unfold in law, in Massachusetts, where Catholic Charities uh, was basically told that it would have to place children with gay couples, or and, and if it didn't, it would be subject to discrimination uh, statutes, right? Because treating now, in Massachusetts, treating two guys in a union any differently from a husband and wife means you're like a bigot who, who wouldn't, you know, if you wouldn't give children to interracial couples, we're going to treat you like that. Uh, you're beginning to see the consequence. I, I you know, uh, a beauty pageant queen goes on national television and says, no offense, you know, but I, I think marriage should be a man and a woman. And my goodness, she would have thought that 
you would have thought she said that it was okay for men and women to live together out of out of, out of wedlock. You know, I mean, just the the, the 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 description of her speech is hateful and something that she needs to apologize for. It's because the heart of the gay marriage movement is people, and some of them may well be in this room, really do believe you are a bigot if you don't if you think there's something unique about husbands and wives and mothers and fathers. And the goal, once the law says this, it's going to be more difficult and more costly for culture and private institutions to, uh, to resist or, or sustain a, a, a Christian culture of marriage, but even the common inheritance of mankind, the common idea. I don't know how you raise men to be family men in the current environment. It's challenging. But how do you do it if the government says the idea that a child needs a father as well as a mother is somehow like racism? Okay, it's going to be much harder. So the bottom line for me on that issue, and I know there are many people concerned about marriage who may not share my views on gay marriage, um, is marriage has its, we have a new problem in society. Like how do, how do we, this whole gay and lesbian thing, like how do we, how do, we, how do we treat each other? How do we demonstrate respect for the human person? Uh, how, how do we integrate this into society? It's a new problem. And what's happening is that this is not what marriage is about, okay? Marriage has its own dignity and purpose. It, it's not rooted in animus towards gay people or anyone else. And what is happening is, in my view, a profound injustice, wrenching this institution away from its own mission and trying to make it address this new problem in a way uh, that can, 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 can only make it less effective at doing what it needs to do. What it needs to do. And um, so I think that we will see moving forward that the challenge of the family is one of the core challenges to what we used to call Western civilization. Let me leave you with this thought. Every society that is otherwise best for human flourishing, stable, democratic, rule of law, opportunities, has a crisis in the family. And they're experiencing the double crisis of high rates of family fragmentation, divorce and unmarried childbearing, and uh, particularly in Europe, a sudden collapse in the willingness of young men and women to make the next generation at all. Right? The, uh, the birth rates in Europe uh, Cannot, uh, civilizations cannot be carried by birth rates that they have in Europe. You know, the demographer, UN demographers refer to anything be below 1.5 ch children per woman. Doesn't matter how many children men have, it's how many children women have demographically. <laughs> you just divide them up among the women. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, very low fertility. And if you think about it, so there are countries now which are approaching one child per woman, which at that point you are cutting your generation next, you're cutting your population in half in every generation. Now it takes you a long time to know this because if you stop having children, the first thing that happens is you have a lot less expensive dependents around and there's still, you know, people have to die off before you notice. But you start with 100, the next generation's 50, the next generation is 25, the fourth generation in living memory. 12.5. This is not sustainable, to use the vernacular. So in, in both of these forms, I think that the family is the core thing that these other, the societies that are otherwise good at everything else relative to all known human history, this is the one thing, challenge, that we have yet to figure out how to do. How do we sustain these great goods? How do we sustain choice and enterprise and rule of law and democratic society? and opportunities and consumer, uh, you know, the, the, the rich variety of consumer culture and create a, a good enough family system to create, sustain, and protect the next generation. That's the challenge um, that, that we face. And if we don't face it, then the values, that the civilizations of which we treasure are uh, not going to be around uh, in a couple of hundred years or even sooner. So, um, but America is the place that learns how to do things that other societies don't. And so I look forward to continuing to work on this challenge and I can take any questions you have on it.
Keith Zeldin of our Christian Doctor Department is going to moderate the discussion, but I do have a quick question to, while she makes her long way up here. Um, in a recent column, you enumerated some of the outrageous uh, developments overseas, and in England particularly, um, which make our own experience look rather mild so far. Would you just talk to the audience about those briefly? Yeah. Again, the core driving this is the idea that orientation is like race. In Great Britain, our sister democracy, with the strongest free speech tradition, um, a Catholic bishop was told that he could not fire a Catholic school principal who entered a civil union with another man. Now, they think they have religious liberty in Great Britain. They told him that if he was the religion teacher, he could have been fired. But the job of the principal has nothing to do with teaching religion. And so therefore, it was discrimination to require that he at least appear to live consistent with the teachings of the Catholic Church. It actually gets worse than that. An Anglican minister over there was fined, uh, uh, I mean bishop, was fined 100,000 pounds because he refused to hire an openly gay youth minister, okay, to, to be the youth minister for in his diocese. And the government in Great Britain believes that it can, in fact, punish a, a Anglican bishop uh, on using employment law as a vehicle for discrimination for failing to do that. Um, in Canada, there was a um, evangelical uh, charity. They run a thousand homes for disabled adults. It's very good work. They require all their employees to sign a code of conduct that it's quite extensive. We, we, I don't think we do this in, in our institutions, but you know, no pornography, no fornication, no adultery, no, and no, no same-sex acts either. And uh, one of their employees uh, self discovered or identified herself as lesbian and entered a relationship and they let her, terminated her. And uh, the government told, the, told this charity that they were not allowed to do this, this was discrimination, and then ordered them to submit a re-education plan so that they could re-educate all their own employees, right? Um, so requiring the charity, actually, to create its own re-education camps. Um, in, uh, closer in this country, these are some of the things we're seeing, again, driven by this idea. In New Jersey, um, there's a Methodist group it's, again, it's not a church, it's a charity. It's a, one of those Bible study camps from the 19th century, and they do, you know, they run soup kitchens. They do a lot of things. And they have a beachfront pavilion, and they let anyone have a wedding, but they don't let same-sex union ceremonies because that's violation of Methodist canon law. And uh, they were uh, brought up before the Human Rights Tribunal. Uh, the government stripped them of part of their tax exemption which was given to people who allowed a beachfront property to be used by the public. So, I mean, they, they weren't trying to keep gay and lesbian people from strolling and enjoying the beach. They just, they would not do civil unions on their own ceremonies. And um, they had to, go, they basically had to withdraw from letting anyone use the property as the prize. Otherwise, they would have been forced to do that. Uh, there's a Christian physician in California. She, she does artificial technology. Um, of artificial insemination. She had a lesbian patient and she had no problem with that. She was willing to treat her to help restore her fertility because that's a natural function of the body and it, then it would be up to her what she did with that, right? Uh, but she drew the line. She did not want to personally create a fatherless child. And she, the lesbian cup sued her. Uh, as the suit unfolded, she went on and Obviously, this, this doctor didn't keep this lesbian woman from her choices. She had went on to have three couples. There's plenty of doctors who will do this. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled that, yes, in fact, the government can tell this Christian physician she has to choose between her faith and her job because this is, this is an example of discrimination and bigotry. This, this, this idea that you don't want to make a fatherless child makes you like somebody who doesn't want to serve a black person. That's, um, we've seen a marriage counselor in Georgia uh, again, who told a lesbian couple, or I'm not sure if it was men or women, a gay couple, that she didn't personally feel like she would be the right counselor to help counsel them to stay, stay together, because that was contrary to her beliefs, but she would refer them to a counselor, and her, they went after her job. Now, I don't know if they succeeded in it, but she was, she was a government employee, so it's, it's complicated. 
you know, this will be contested. America has the strongest religious liberty protections and the most, also a much stronger religious basis in society. So it's more expensive to do what they're doing in Europe here. Um, but it is being driven. That the idea that gay is like black does not lead to tolerance because we don't tolerate, I mean, we do literally tolerate racism. We don't execute you or throw you in jail. But the law intervenes very powerfully to marginalize and repress an idea that the government has defined as contrary to basic norms of equality. I don't think gay marriage is an equality issue because I don't think, same, you know, relevant to the purposes of marriage, that same-sex unions are the same as opposite-sex unions. So I think, to me, it's, it's an, an intellectual absurdity. But if the government adopts that view, either through the courts or the legislatures, it's going to have consequences for a lot of people, especially faith communities. Yeah. Get back to your closing remarks on how do you solve the demographic problem. Obviously, we're showing the way by importing all the Latin American Catholics. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, they have a lot of immigrants in Europe, too. Everyone always says that, but the difference is, and I don't, I, it's hard to, to tease out because a lot of these countries, like France, don't actually keep track of the nationality or really. So you, 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 don't, you can't find out what the state of Muslim birth rate is in, in, in France. They, they, uh, so, uh, but I would just note that the idea that Europe is all white and homogenous is not really true, which if you go, I'm sure you know that. But the other truth is that if you look at college educated white women in this country, the birth rates are not quite at replacement, but they would be the envy of most European uh, countries. There's something different going on here. Uh, it could change very rapidly. Um, and also, our, we dipped, we're, I think we're the only country that really dipped well below replacement in the, in the 70s and early 80s. And then we climbed back up. We're, we're actually, we're having two children per person. Too many of them not inside marriage, but at least we're having the babies. And I, I thought, I mean, no one knows exactly why, what, why, what this American exceptionalism is about. But I, uh, I think it's, again, small, the, the demographic group that has the most, one of the most, the, the state that has the best family figures is Utah. Okay, the lowest out of wedlock birth rates, the lowest divorce rates, and the highest fertility rates. It's, it's Utah. So, I mean, I, Maybe it's that we have Mormons and they don't. I, I, I don't know. Um, but I think it's three, three or four things. Especially since we don't have any of that. Everyone always says in Europe, well, if you have all this panoply of family supports and income supports, for and we don't have any of that. I mean, even Italy, which is considered beggarly by European standards, has much more financial support from the government for families than we do. What we have that turns out to make a difference uh, economically is a flexible labor market. So women don't have to make an all or nothing choice between their, their whole identities. It's very common for women to be home with children for a while and then to work or to do part time and to do, so not just the financially that helps, but I think the identity issues in Europe is just much more sclerotic economy. You get off the career path and you're just off. So every baby is expensive in a way that it isn't. It's, it's difficult for women. So we actually, in this perverse to the European mind, make it easier to have children than, than they do. We're also more mobile. So it's, you can go and if you want to raise children and have a family, you pick up and you go somewhere where you're surrounded by other people doing the same thing, right? So we create the mobility of American society makes creating cohesive and supportive family communities easier. Um, I think religion is a key, the two, the two other big difference are religion and uh, patriotism, which I'm connecting because they both give you a sense that you're part of a community larger than the individual, right? Why do you have children? Okay, so the first child turns you into a mother, and that child isn't likely to die, so you get, you know, most of the emotional benefits of children you can get from that first baby, but why do you have the second, the third, or even sometimes the fourth? Well. People, people do it because they have a sense that they're doing something important, that they're making a contribution, that the sacrifice of self-interest and time and appetite is in the service of something important. And I think that, that, that America is still a place where people conceive of themselves as being part of a larger community. The faith community is very key, and, but even the national community, which is very different uh, from the way Europeans, I think, uh, think at this point. So that's my, my thoughts. 
Uh, are you heartened by the uh, phenomenal growth of the evangelical movement and these mega churches with uh, would appear to be uh, a lot of new uh, disciples, devotees, or whatever, in, in terms of their inculcation of uh, family values within uh, those uh, units? Well, I, yeah, I do, I do think uh, that the vibrancy of the Protestant Christian, which is at this point mostly evangelical, that is the vibrant communities are mostly evangelical, is supportive to, let me just say, I think it's supportive to Catholics in America as well. We live in a more religious society generally, which makes it easier compared to Europe. And the, and the competition among communities, it can be competition for adherence, but it can also be the generation of ideas and relationships that, it, that can be helpful across the borders of faith communities. Um, evangelicals are doing relatively good at transmitting ideas so they're much better at transmitting the idea that abortion is wrong, that you should be married before you have children. Um, divorce less so because, of course, Protestants have a less firm basis for objecting to divorce, but you see signs of movements about that within these communities as well. Um, and I know of individual evangelical megachurch communities that I think are actually helping people resist the, the, the sexually degrading culture. But on average, evangelicals are not a group distinguished by, let's say, powerful indicators of familism in behavior. So um, it's, that, you know, it's very, very hard to, if you want to live a good life, the society doesn't make it easier, and it's hard to transmit these values to your children. And that's part of when the wider culture is not very supportive, and evangelicals find it too. I, I do. You know, I'm, in doing this marriage work, uh, Carrie Prejean, who is the Miss California, I, I know her pastor. I, I actually worked with him to get Prop 8 on the ballot. Um, we went out there and, uh, and working with Bishop Cordelioni, uh, we, we got Prop 8 on the ballot before the Supreme Court had, state Supreme Court had ruled. And uh, he's, it's just an amazing community. It's called The Rock. It's like 12,000 people, uh, you know, on any given Sunday. They have uh, 60 different ministries. Uh, the, the, what they give back to the community is extraordinary. The average age of uh, their parishioners, they probably don't call them parishioners, is, uh, is 30. Um, and you know, I knew when I saw that Carrie, you could see, when, I don't know how many of you saw the YouTube clip of her. She's asked about what she thinks about gay marriage. You can see she's fumbling, she's stalling, she knows what she really thinks is not going to get her the crown, and it's either her or Miss North Carolina, and she's, and then you can see her in her head, she can see her go, no, I gotta, I gotta say what I think, I gotta stand up and say what I believe, and I, I told Miles, her pastor, I must be a heck of a Christian community you have out there, because I, I knew it was his voice in her head that caused that to happen, and by the way, I think she single-handedly interrupted a, the, the progress of, of gay marriage because of the fear that, you know, that, the opinion polls have all swung. I mean, the opposition to gay marriage jumped nine points in the, in the uh, or uh, support for gay marriage dropped nine points in the last two months. Um, all of a sudden, people are talking about it. And uh, so, uh, if I didn't believe in God before, I'd be inclined to. So I'm, I'm, I, I think the bishops in South America and Latin America who are complaining about the competition, uh, while I understand it, are, are somewhat short-sighted. It's much better to be America than France. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs>